Good afternoon then, gents, uh, and welcome to another BEMCO live webinar event, uh, highlighting the opportunities of becoming a smart home electrician. This is the third in the series, um, so I know there's been quite a bit of interest in this subject from our, our members. Um, just before we get underway with the webinar, I just want to check that everybody can hear me clearly. Hopefully you can, and I hope everybody's internet connection is okay for this afternoon's event. With that in mind, it may be advisable to remind you to switch off your video if you have not already done so uh, during the presentation. Um, that will reduce your internet bandwidth requirements and hopefully you'll get a very good uh, view of the presentation. To begin with, let me again introduce myself. My name is Bob Kearney. I'm Select's Technical Standards Advisor. I represent Select at JPL 64 and a number of their subcommittees. And I'm here, as per the previous two uh, webinars, to introduce this event and to highlight Select's continued support of BEMCO and to thank them for letting us participate these webinars are to promote the technology of smart homes, uh, and we hope that this will provide many new opportunities for our members who can adapt to the technology and provide additional services for their customers. Uh, over the last number of weeks, the interest has certainly been good. There's been a high number attending these webinars, and again today, equally a high number of people have registered. So hopefully you'll all enjoy today's event. Today's webinar will begin with an online tutorial explaining how to design, set up or commission uh, and control a smart home installation using the Lupron RA2 select products that we showed at last week's webinar. And uh, it's going to be presented by Ross. Uh, Ross is advised it will take around about 45 to maybe an hour in time to go through the presentation, so bear with us there. If there's any questions um, during the presentation, if you could raise them using the chat facility on Zoom and direct it to everyone. Uh, Craig, Craig McGowan is also with us. You remember Craig takes a, a long-standing select member and also the Lanarkshire branch chairman. He's got uh, an extensive knowledge of select uh, RA2 product and smart homes installations. So I would encourage you to raise questions during the presentation and Craig will coordinate uh, the answers with input from Ross. Uh, Ross is obviously Lutron's expert on the subject and uh, hopefully between the two of them, you'll Get all the answers to the questions that you might have. Um, that should take us through to the early afternoon, uh, around about two, where we'll conclude the event um, when all the questions and answers have been dealt with. So without further delay, I'll now hand you over to Ross. Ross, if you want to take the guys through uh, today's event. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that, Bob. So we'll just get this quickly set up. So. I think that's the first time in my life I've ever been called an expert in anything, but uh, I'll, I'll take that when it comes. So, guys, I must reiterate, any questions, put them in the chat. Craig's going to be looking at it, so any questions as we're going through, ask them to Craig. If they're relevant, we'll get the answer to you, hopefully straight away. If not, we'll get to the end. But I want this to be quite engaging because listening to me for an hour, may get a bit difficult, but let's hope that we'll get through this and it'll all be good. So today we're going to be focusing on the RA2 system, which is our wireless smart home. And it's the simple, reliable, affordable scenario that we're going for. So today's agenda, we're going to have a quick look at the UK smart home market, uh, where that is and where it's going. We're also going to look at how to design, set up and control an RA2 system. And we're going to look at what makes Lutron a wee bit different from the marketplace with regards to the wireless technology, the brand that we've got behind us, and some parts of third-party integration, and showing you how to do that, and then we'll follow that up by the question and answer. 
So the UK smart home market, what is a smart home when we talk about this? We're primarily looking at things that go in the house and they connect to the internet. That is primarily what smart home is. So from this, we've got lighting, we've got smart home assistants such as Alexa, Google, Siri on your phone. We've got speakers such as Sonos, we've got security systems, etc. Now, the bit that we're obviously really interested in at Lutron is the lighting and the shades part of things, or blinds as we call it in the UK. I need to take my American hat off when I, I talk about these things. So moving on, in the smart home market, at the end of 2019, it was three billion. That is a, a sizable number in its own right. Now, moving on 20 months from now, it's estimated that market will increase to just under 5 billion. Now, the housing stock in the UK isn't going to increase that much. So what we're kind of looking at and what we've decided on, or deciphered, I should say, from this is most of these buildings are going to be retrofit with smart homes or smart products. So we need to really focus on something that's easy to install rather than something that is really only required for new homes. So with that in mind, that increase is a 50% increase. So if you were to ask anybody in business if they could increase their business in the next 20 months by 50%, I'm sure they would absolutely bite your hand off. So this is a, an emerging technology uh, from all sides uh, and there's good potential for good business growth there. So I'm glad that you're on because hopefully you will be the entrepreneurs of the future and help us grow our business as well. So what is resonating with the customers today, just now, that I would love to say it's lighting, I'd love to say it's shades, but it's that's not what's getting people in a smart home just now. The big thing that's getting people in a smart home was initially Sonos with their smart speakers. And that has driven the market in a direction that's expanding it for everybody. But the bit that's dragging us into the market quicker than most is the voice control. So Google, Amazon, Alexa, and Siri, sorry, from HomeKit, they've got massive marketing uh, potential. They are spending millions on TV marketing, online marketing, etc., and they are showing people the advantages of smart home, asking lights to go on and off, asking blinds to go up and down. That is then our introduction into this market. When people see that on TV, they want it. And that is where we can then fill that gap, give them information that they need and supply the products that they require and obviously help you guys to, to get that stuff on site, installed and set up appropriately. So on that, the RA2 Select system is our wireless system that helps for new builds and also retrofit. So for this system, we really want to make it super simple. We do not want complicated systems. Anytime you add complications, it just adds problems to everybody's life. Great believer in the KISS scenario, so keep it simple. I won't say the last word on that one, but uh, it is so true. If you can keep things nice and simple, everybody understands what they're getting, and it works, and it works first time. You don't get called back to job sites. It is just good all round. So... On that note, we kind of look at, this goes back, obviously, candles. That's a bit too far back from where we need to be. But if you look at technologies that's came about through the years, halogens were actually surprisingly easy to control. CFLs were probably a disaster in the history with mercury and all the rest of it in there, but they did save a bit of energy. LEDs have came about with this drive to get lumens per watt up and wattage down but they became incredibly hard to deal with and some different technologies haven't kept up to, up to date with where they need to be. This is why we have redeveloped uh, a dimmer and I'll go into that in more depth why we've done it, but we've developed it solely for LEDs uh, to com uh, combat all these sort of issues with flicker and uh, dead travel when you're trying to move a dimmer and nothing happens. Uh, and just to let you know that the first ever dimmer was done by Lutron. The guy that owns the company is no longer with us, but a guy, Joel Spiro, he created the electronic dimmer back in the late 50s, uh, and it's been about ever since then. So 
on this, or hopefully everybody's familiar with how to put a, a dimmer into a circuit. Um, this slide was primarily done for a different audience, but it's just, it's nice to show people exactly what we're looking at and what we have problems with. So when we look at this, obviously an inline dimmer, we have no neutral connected here. So we're basically live in, dim live out, up to the fixture. And often this causes a whole world of problems. Okay, so we've got two things that we can help from that scenario. We've got our Lutron, oh, sorry, Lutron LED Center of Excellence, which is a website, which I'm gonna take you for a quick whirlwind tour of this website. So just bear with me while I adjust this window so that you can all see it. So this is where, I mean, we, we get asked the question quite a lot, and I'm sure this is a problem you've had in the past, where you've been on a job site, you've got an LED lamp, you put a dimmer in, and suddenly you start getting issues where it's maybe flickering when you dim it down low, it's maybe not dimming at all, it maybe bursts on when you switch the dimmer on, up to full, then goes down to its level. Various different fault issues happen with LEDs and dimmers when you get incompatibility issues. You may even get a dimmer that's humming and buzzing. That's that's not good either, obviously. So from that side of things, we really want to check that the lamps are approved, or if you're specking a new job, make sure that you're picking an approved lamp. So from that, what we do is we come to this website, which is lutron.com forward slash LED tool. We untick all the American voltages that we don't want, so we're on 240 volt CE. We want to keep this one ticked, so this is the lamps that are tested in the last two years. Any LED that's over two years old is probably not in the market anymore, to be honest, because the rate of development on LED lamps is uh, moving incredibly quick. So keep that one ticked. From the fixture type, most common that we obviously see is the GU10 lamp. Uh, you don't have to worry about this one. You can just leave that select all. The Lutron control, we want to go down to the RA2 select inline dimmer, select it. Now, if you've got a brand that you specifically want, you can come here and select whichever brand you want. If there's, if you deal with whoever, Mega Man, Aurora, Bell, Crompton, whoever it is, G, we've got no affiliations with any one of these. It's just, we're trying to do testing to make the lives of your guys and jobs a lot easier. So I'll just leave it as select all. So hit search. Obviously we're doing this on Zoom, it's a wee bit slower with internet connection, but so I've now got a search result that's came back and we've got different manufacturers here that are listed. Now, a quick way to do top trumps, hopefully everybody remembers that wee game that we, we used to have where you had the fastest car or fastest acceleration. You can look at this, which is the dimming range. So you want to try and get something that's got quite pretty good performance. And you can team it up with the brand that you're happy with. So for example, just a Mega Man one, it's the first one that kind of come to. You can click onto this. We know that it's going 100% uh, down to 10. And then the RA2 select, we're knowing that we can put 24, 24 lamps on there. Just so you are, I don't think anybody would ever put 24 lamps onto a circuit, but uh, I have seen some bars and restaurants deciding that they can try and do as many as they can. So one that I actually looked up earlier for a customer was the Aurora lamp, which is a, a fairly common one that's used. And on this, if I go down, RA2 select one there, so you're getting decent dimming, 100 down to 10%, and you can actually stick 62 lamps on. So this, this isn't a challenge to see how many <laughs> points someone can put in a lighting circuit. I would never, never go past sort of 15 points in a lighting circuit, but you will, you will see people that will go past that and you will go into bars and restaurants. So if you do need lots of lamps on a, a lighting circuit, that's, that's an option for you. So hopefully that's a wee insight to the website and the approvals that can be there, etc. So yeah, hopefully that's useful to you. Just jump back to the slide if we can. 
guys, just remember if there's any questions or that, just post them in and Craig will, Craig will hopefully give me a quick shout and go from there. So coming back to the scenario that we had, so we've got the inline dimmer. I was talking about obviously live in, dim live up to the light fit and normally when that was halogen there was no issues. I don't know if you're a wee bit of trivia, so the dimmer, because it's an electronic dimmer, it needs to sink some some current through the load, so that will complete the circuit by going back through the neutral. When that was a halogen lamp, there was no issues because you were basically, it was a small resistance that was in the circuit. You never had any issues. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, any issues where you put an LED lamp in and suddenly you've got a dull, or real dull glow, or sometimes you've got, it'll charge up like a capacitor than discharge, so you'll get a wee flicker and flash now and again. Uh, you tend to see that on sort of lower wattage um, LEDs such as like your plinth lights, your stair lights and stuff like that. Now, with this being said, the reason that we do not do a back box version of our RA2 dimmer is primarily because it causes too many issues with the LED. We really want the neutral connected. Okay, with the neutral connected, you know exactly what's happening on that line voltage. We know when to dim the lamp and we can avoid all of these sort of issues. We don't have to sink any current through the load. We can sit there, monitor the line that's coming in and we can dim that successfully. So this inline dimmer is specifically designed for handling LED loads. You'll find a lot of dimmers out there in the marketplace have not been updated with the technology and they're trying to do, um, lead, normally it's referred to as leading edge dimming, but it's a cheaper form of dimming. They will be trying to do that on LED lamps and it's, it's generally not overly successful. The, the other thing I should mention from this is that inline dimmer does trailing edge. Generally, that's been the more expensive way of doing dimming, but it's the more successful way of doing it with LED loads. Uh, just a, a wee bit of brief history. Leading edge is primarily designed for anything that is a resistive load that's within the circuit. So halogen lamps are resistive load. Anything that's inductive or capacitive, so anything that's got any electronics within it, really requires uh, the dimmer to be trailing edge. And that is where we had issues in the past where you had leading edge dimmers, as in rotary dimmers, going on to low voltage track lights and you would have the dimmer that would be humming and buzzing. That's not a good scenario because it's an incompatibility. It should have really been a trailing edge uh, rotary dimmer that was on the wall. So that's why we, in this instance, have opted for a trailing edge dimmer. This, although I'm saying trailing edge and keep saying it, that will also work halogen as well. So if you do have any jobs that have got existing halogen, haven't been swapped out for LED, you can still do halogen from there. The, the other thing that I want to just reiterate on this is, we're talking about an RA2 system. Now, the system can be as basic as an inline dimmer, oh, sorry, an inline dimmer and a Pico remote. So if you just want a dimmer, you can get these two to work together by simply pressing the button on the inline dimmer and pressing the off button on the Pico remote. That will pair the two together and you've got a simple dimmer that just works with the LEDs that are installed. It's only after that, if you want to get into a system, then you start adding the, the main repeater and creating a, a wee system from there. But from this scenario, it just it's a great get out of jail. Although I'm calling that a dimmer as well, this could be a switching module as well. So if you want to just have remote switching of something, then you've got this option there as well. So the, the other thing here that I want to cover is the wireless nature of this. So, Ross, can I need... jump in with a question? Is that okay? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. By all means, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Just uh, going back to the, um, obviously, the, 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 the lamps and things. Yep. See, see for like a, maybe like a, a company that does an integrated LED. Is there yep. any facility for that? Is there any yeah, any so... done on them? So we primarily focused at the retrofit uh, lamp market. We have done testing and we will do uh, project specific testing as well, depending on the, the size of the job, et cetera. So I know that, I mean, one, for example, is like Collingwood and Haler's. Um, we have done testing on their stuff. So on that side of things, I really just drop, drop me a line uh, and I'll double check and see if we've tested it or not. And uh, I can tell you what the results were. 
but primarily because we were kind of looking at the retrofit market for this, most of it has been on the retrofit lamp side of things. But I do think that's one thing we'll need to look at. Um, it's just quite difficult when you look at the marketplace, the amount of uh, manufacturers out there from the lighting side of things, uh, it's, it's a lot of testing. And even to test one GU10 from us, it, it takes weeks upon weeks of testing uh, to do it. Uh, it's not just a quick we throw it on and make sure it works. We are, we're monitoring everything to make sure it's, it's solid and we can put it out there as a approved lamp to work with the dimmer. Okay. Ross, Ross could I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, have you had any issues with uh, the numbers of lamps tripping circuit breakers with, the, with regard to the tripping characteristics, type B, type C, yeah, so type B, it, it, in rush current, basically? Yeah, so on the, because we're doing a soft start on this one, not quite as much. I mean, when I'm saying I would normally limit to 15 points in a lighting circuit, most people don't take it past that. The bit that I've had major issues with is when you start looking at LED tape and trying to dim that. LED tape, the power supplies that come for that, and you can actually go on to the more common manufacturers, I'll not name their names, but you can go onto their website, and they actually tell you that you can't have any more than two power supplies on a Type C 16 amp breaker. It's, it was just horrendous. They are getting better, but um, yeah, you need to be cautious with the amount of LEDs that you're sticking on. I know that I came across that on the, the hydro when they were looking at fixtures. I wrote it down that we could only, the fixtures were quite high wattage. They were 280 watts. Uh, and it was a 16 amp, sorry, a 10 amps type C breaker that we had in there, and they limited it to five fixtures. So that's only a five amp running current, uh, and they limited it to five amps, or else it would it would trip the breaker. Yeah. Um, you do have some people that jump it up to a type D, which I think is a bit wrong, to be honest. Uh, most of the times we're seeing domestic, obviously it's type B breakers. More commercial, you've seen type C. So does that hopefully answer your question or? Yeah, yeah. I know that a lot of lamp manufacturers are putting guidance on that um, with regard to the inrush. They, they were saying that it could be up to 253 times the normal running current of the lamp. So a type B could easily trip. Yeah. Just, so just on, a, on, a, on a job that, and I've, I've, I've seen this, I've, well, I know this is a fact I've seen, I think it's 25 BLGU 10s uh, on the one dimmer module, and it worked fine. Yeah, so, a lot. It's no ideal, but it, there wasn't any issues with it. And I think the breaker for that it was definitely a B type. And I think it was a B10 amp that was doing it, but that wasn't the only thing on this. Obviously, the circuit, but it was uh, that was one of the dimming modules. It was uh, it, yeah. it, it didn't cause any trouble. I think if you if you look at some of the older technology that we had as well, so fluorescent switch start had an, an inrush, metal halide got even a bit worse from that side of things. And LED, so metal halide used to be about 10 times the running current, which was the inrush. Uh, LEDs can actually be nearly 100 times uh, the running current for inrush. It, it can be quite horrendous. Um, I think things do seem to be getting a bit better though. I think when you look at the LED lamps, initially when they were brought out, they weren't spending a lot of money on the power components that were at the back of the LED. All, your, all the money was put into the actual LED chip because everybody was fighting on cost and sort of driving that down. Now the LED chips have came such high efficacy, so the, the amount of light that you're getting out for the amount of wattage that's going in, they're now starting to put a wee bit more development and cost into the actual control part that goes in the back of the actual driver, the power supply part uh, in the back of the LED. So I think that 100 is starting to come down. But yeah, as I say, on the dimmer side of things, we've got that sort of soft start that kind of helps uh, the sort of high rush because obviously if something comes on, it full straight away. You're just whacking it, all that current straight through it. Whereas if you're soft starting it up, at least you've got that ability to just ramp it up slowly. I think also in the I'm right in saying that in the inline dimmer as well, Ross, if the if it's too much and it, obviously the dimmer doesn't like it, the power supplies the, the power's too big, it uh, I think it, it signals red to say that it's, yeah. it's it's too much for it. So it doesn't it just like cuts it out right away. It recognizes that the the 
the wattage is too high. Yeah, so so the dimmer the dimmer's got some intelligence built into it. As if you short it, you get, it cuts cuts the power going out to the load, etc. And it flashes red. The same thing happens with an overcurrent as well. So the dimmer will tell you quite quickly if it's not happy with what it's doing. But obviously, on this, the the breaker is a part of it as well. So you just need to be cautious from that side of things. Okay, okay. Are we okay. good to carry on then? All right. All right, cool. All right, um, so looking at the wireless side of things and what can actually help you guys. So from this, th this resonates with me. I, I, so a strange thing is in Scotland, I was explaining this to someone, raglan, you speak to someone in England and they have no idea what raglan is. So we'll talk about channeling and chasing, just, to, just in case we've got any of our English friends on. So I, this is a job I think I hate the most. I, it's dirty, it's messy, it causes destruction. The bit that frustrates me more with this is you're having to organise this with other trades. You're trying, trying to find a good plasterer is just a nightmare at best of times, and then trying to tie in with a decent plasterer to resolve this. By all means, you can mix up your own mix and sort of fill in the, the channel, but I think if you're really going to leave a decent job, if you're going to be doing channeling, etc., you really want to get that wall skimmed again. So that you can't see where the break has been, and yeah, it's just you need really need it skimmed. And when I look at that, normally, and you can tell me different to this, but normally I think it's about ten pound a square meter, roughly, for skimming a wall. And if you take kind of an average wall, I, I used to do this for the Edinburgh tenements where you had five meters by four, so it was two hundred pound to sort of skim that wall. If you take it for like a standard build you probably be about five meters by 2.5 high. Uh, and that still equates to 125 pounds to skim a wall. And that's not even including the, the effort that you've went to. So from that alone, that's more or less paying for the kit. So it, it, in my eyes, that, that makes it very, very worthwhile. Apart from the fact that you're not having to deal with the plaster or the decorators and all the rest of it to go with it. Plus the fact that from the occupant's point of view, you're in and out a lot quicker. You've not got a week's worth of destruction. You've maybe got one day and you're you're gone. So and it helps you guys do a lot more jobs. And I don't want to be the negative man on the COVID side of things, but if we do end up going into another lockdown or anything like that, if you can squeeze more jobs in now by using RF technology and get more jobs done, um, that can only benefit everyone from that side of things. But let's hope we don't. Let's hope we're all just back working and get back to normal. So moving on, we. This was a. I was speaking to one of the guys. I think it was Stuart uh, up at iProtect. I wish maybe I'd done a poor performance before, but uh, Lutron actually do automated shades as well. So we supply the complete thing. So you take measurements of the window. You pick fabric from our website, which is lutronfabrics.com. And then we ship you a shade complete. Now, this one that's shown in the window is battery operated. I'll go into more detail on that later on. But it can be as simple as having a Pico remote talking to that shade that's held up by four screws. That's as simple as it can be. You can also add it into the RA2 system so it can start becoming parts of scenes, etc. But if you have the option to just have this, and at the time I was speaking to Stuart, it was about a job uh, for uh, someone that was disabled and they just wanted the ability to put the shades open and close, that could be a good enough setup for them. They may not need the app control, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, just bear in mind that we can go basic on this or we can go a bit more complicated. Still keeping it simple, but we can go a wee bit more complex if you need to. So the RA2 system, which this is primarily why we're on, this is the exciting part of things. So we've got the app control, which everybody kind of starts to love. We've got the simple Pico designs, which the aesthetics are great compared to the horrible Motley Gang switches we can do, etc. We've got occupancy control. We've got the load controllers that we can talk about. And then we've got the automated blinds. So there's, there's plenty to go out from this. But how does that all fit into the house where are we looking to put it so we've got the pico control which is going to sit on the walls so that's replacing your light switches uh, interesting one is this doesn't have to be a one for one replacement uh, you can start taking away switches if they're not in the right positions you can start adding extra switches 
Um, say you've you've done a slapping through and you've done a door going out to the garden and there was never any cables at that door. So now you can add a switch by simply just screwing this straight to the wall. We don't have to go and channel or raggle cables to that point. So that's that's fantastic. That helps quite a lot. The inline dimmers and switches that we're talking about normally in a retrofit scenario, they're going to live up in the ceiling. So you're going to come out from the consumer unit, you're going to interrupt the circuit before the first light, and you're going to put the inline dimmer or inline switch in. The inline dimmer and the inline switch will control multiple light fittings, so you don't know, don't need a one-for-one -one relationship there. Uh, and that's shown in the living room part of this, where you've got one inline dimmer and you've got four downlights in there. The other one which we've just came out with, which is actually really, really sort of selling fast for us, is this lamp dimmer. So essentially it's an extension lead with a dimmer built into the middle of it. That way all you're doing, plugging it into a 13 amp socket, plug in the table lamp or the floor lamp, add it into the RA2 system, and it can be part of a scene or it can be individually controlled. So that's, that's a great wee product that's just came out. We've got the battery operated shades, which go into the window reveals, and then we've got the main repeater. This is the part that gives you all the, the nice stuff, such as the integration with Sonos, the voice control, the app control, the time clock control, geofencing, etc. But we'll come on to more detail on that, so we'll jump on to the next one. So how do we make a system? So we've tried to simplify this. There's too many, I was once told that lighting controls was a black art, black magic, and it was all complicated. And I think it was a guy trying to keep himself in a job, to be honest. I, I'm not one of those guys. I would rather use guys had the knowledge yourself and you were able to go and make yourself some money by doing this. Uh, and by all means, give me a phone anytime. I have no issues with that. I just want to give you guys the ability to do this yourself. And this system is fantastic for that. It breaks down all those sort of barriers. So we'll jump in. This is the simple step, step one, two, and three. So step one, main repeater. What do we need to do here? We need to plug it into the router that's in the house. So the BT router, Sky router, the Virgin router, etc. It also needs to be plugged into a 13 amp outlet, which is, this is just a five volt um, USB power supply. And that plugs into the, the main repeater. Next step is we Sorry, are- can I, just, so, can I just jump in? Yep. You could you could actually then take that in a cat five or wherever anywhere you wanted to. Yeah, as yeah. As yeah. And yeah. so so if it's nearer your the room you're wanting to actually control or if you're just doing a single room, you could do that as well. Yeah, by all means. I mean most in most domestic cases I think the the rear is going to come in close to the front door, it's going to come into a utility or a cupboard. Um I'll come onto the ranges of the repeater, but I've generally not seen a, a three or four bed house that really needs uh, the RF extended. Uh, to give you an insight on that, my house is it's an old Georgian place, so it's got quite thick walls. And it's, the main repeater sits in the middle. And I can get, probably it's about 10 metres to the outside world going through two 900 mil stone, sandstone walls. And then I can get about 30 to 40 metres away from the house uh, and still have the RF. After that, it starts dropping off a wee bit. Uh, but the the response in the RF is phenomenal. It's really good. I'm not trying to say that word on a Friday. It's been too long a week. But um, yeah, as you say, Craig, if you need to, you can run a Cat5, but most people will plug that right in next to the uh, router. And then if they do, we've got an auxiliary repeater that is kindly coming right on as a, a segue right into that. So if you need to boost the RF signal, basically add in an aux auxiliary repeater. Now the system can ha handle four of these. So typically what you would do is the main repeater creates a nine meter bubble around itself. And then you want all the devices to sit in that nine meter bubble. Now, if they don't or can't achieve that, then you would add in an auxiliary repeater. 18 meters away from the main repeater. So that way you've got two nine meter bubbles that are slightly touching and that gives you a huge coverage. I've not really came across a domestic house that needs any more than that. But if you do, if you've got like a, a really elongated building and you need to jump 50 meters down, which I don't think you would, you can 
put another one 18 metres away from the second auxiliary repeater and then a third one and so on. So, yeah, as I say, main repeater, auxiliary repeater, don't really see the need for any more, but mm-hmm. you may need it at some stage, depending on the size of the house. And I think it's a good job. Sorry, Ross, we had the yep. main repeater and two, uh, uh, the main repeater and two auxiliaries, and you've seen the, the Clellan project, the size, yep. but you don't get, don't think you get as many bigger houses <laughs> than that, four-storey, uh, and it's a traditional build. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're we're giving you additional capability by giving you right. the possibility of going to four here. But as as Craig said, that house was huge. It was pretty much two houses merged into one. So that is uh, good capability there. So the next thing that we need to add in here, which is your step two. So this is all about how do we control the lights. So the first one we've got is inline switches. I I hate, this was a slide that I was given, I hate the fact this is referred to as a switch. It's an, it's a relay or a contactor, as we would like to describe it. So it's a, a six amp relay for lighting loads. We reduce it slightly for motor loads, but when we're typically looking at this, we're looking at extract fans, etc. cetera. I, I doubt very much that you're gonna get an extract fan that's more than the sort of two amps. So from that, if you're just needing to switch things on and off, then you're looking at this boy, you can do six amps of lighting load, if you're going to do other things, I'd maybe limit it to kind of two amps. The next one that we've got is the inline dimmer, which is trailing edge. So that's where we're dimming electronics. So nice, smooth dimming, noise free, etc. And this is a, a, a first. I don't know if you all remember dimmers having minimum loadings and all the rest of it. It's a one watt minimum load. So you are not having to sit there and put dummy loads on and uh, putting a pygmy lamp in the circuit or anything like that, one watt minimum load. Uh, that is why this has been designed for LEDs. Now, the other thing we've got is a 250 watt max load. Now, the one thing, if you, you look at the Aurora one that I showed you earlier, I mean, that was 62 lamps, uh, five watts a piece. Do quick mass, that comes over 250 watts. Okay, so if it's on our test report and we say you can do that, you can do that. But this is just a, a rough rule of thumb that you're not going over the 250, 250 watts of load. Uh, and typically just on this as well, if you're doing LED tape, I would tend to stick to probably about 150 watts. Just as I said earlier, the inrush on the LED tape can be horrendously high. So if you are trying to use trailing edge dimming to do that, I would limit it. Uh, we've got better ways of controlling the LED tape, which will come on to. Uh, rather than using that side of things. And then we're on to our lamp dimmer, which we, that was the plug-in extension with the dimmer in the middle. Uh, so this is for your table lamps and your floor lamps. So again, one watt minimum load, designed for LED, trailing edge, so you've not got anything humming and buzzing in the corner. And it's a 200 watt max load on that one. Slightly reduced, but it is very, very good. And again, you can go into approved uh, LED lamp list, and you can see what's there from, from that side of things. Now, the next one looks slightly different, but we, we realized there was a wee bit of a gap in the product portfolio, so this got stolen from the commercial range. So we've got a 16 amp relay, so you can start switching massive loads from that side of things. So pond pumps, uh, fountain pumps. You can either be, I actually had one guy doing this for an infrared heater outside the bar, so you had it tied in so that the, they could actually put an occupancy sensor up uh, at the smoking area and kick in the infrared heater in and out. And you could put that on a time clock. There's various different things that you can do from there. And the last one is a 1 to 10 volt or a 0 to 10 volt, as it's described here, um, unit. Now, if you're doing LED tape, I, I would personally go for the 0 to 10 volt uh, side of things. Uh, you're not really dimming the, the line voltage side of things. What you're doing is there's an extra two core there. Oh, sorry, I need to stop clicking that. There's an extra two core there, which is a positive and negative DC voltage, anything between zero and 10 volts that's getting sent to the driver. Now, if we send it 10 volts, it should be a 100%. If we send it five volts, it should go to about 50%. If we send it zero to one volt, it should be down at its minimum. That is the way it works, nice and simplistic means that if you've got any issues, you can go and get a, a simple meter, put it across the contacts, 
and see what you're getting and see what the light's looking like. So that's the reason that I do that. It also handles five amps. So it is, that would be my route. If you're doing LED tape, I would go for that one before I went for the um, inline dimmer, the trailing edge one. Uh, but depending if you're retrofitting, you may have to use the trailing edge one because you don't need the additional two cores. So that's just one thing to watch out for. But yeah, by all means, if there's anything, give me a call and I can, can explain that one further. Um, so your next, your step three. So we call we call these zone remotes. So the other way you could describe this is a single circuit or single group of light control. So the first one we've got is a, a great one, which is on and off. So the one to the far left, it's got on off and the round button in the middle. So this can give you your on, your off, your raising lower, so fairly self-explanatory. But the one thing that people usually glance over and miss is the round button in the middle. That is your favorite level or favorite scene. So if you've got a specific light that you want to adjust more often than most, you can tie this up with that specific light. You can raise and lower it to where you want it to be, push and hold that middle button for 10 seconds, and it takes a snapshot and saves that level of that light. So that every time you come back and press that middle button, it now goes back to your favorite light. Brilliant for kids' bedrooms where you've got like a wee reading scene or even a nighttime scene for through the night if they, they want some level of light on, press the middle button, away you go. And that's it's really, really good from that side of things. We've got other ones here as well, other flavors. So you've got two button, just simple on off. You've got another one that's uh, two button raise and lower. You've got one that's quite good for hallways. So you've kind of got the light bulb and a one against it and a light bulb and a two against it. Uh, it's great if you want to do kind of, uh, when I say hallways, so you've got a staircase, you've got an upper hall and a lower hall. So button one can do your lower hall, button two can do your upper hall. It's, it's quite nice from that side of things. We've got the individual control for the line that we talked about. And then we've got individual control for audio, which is primarily Sonos as it stands today. And then we get into the, the nice ones, which are the scene setting side of things, which everybody wants. So. I think if everybody was on from Matt's side of thing, uh, Matt doing the tour of his house, he loved the entry one, so he could set the house up how he wanted. He could hit the away button, which was the empty house at the bottom, so that it switched everything off. You've got the bedside one, which the top one actually it's hard to make out, but it's uh, it's hard to make out on this presentation. It's still okay in real life. Uh, it's a wee house with an explanation mark in it. So that is a, a panic button, actually. So what that would do is you would link rooms or groups of lights to this. So if you hear gla glass breaking or you hear a noise or something like that, you can press that button, it fires the lights on to fill, and that way, if anybody has broken in, the, the likelihood is they will get out of the house. You've got the nighttime button, so the half moon button. And that was specifically put there for the bedside so that that was a, a master switch for the house so that you've left the kitchen lights on, you've left the hall lights on, the bathroom lights on. Not a problem. Press one button. And that's it. I, I described this to, I, I was I was demonstrating the system to a husband and wife and the husband's job was to make sure that all the windows were shut and locked and all the doors were locked. <laughs> the woman's job was to make sure all the lights were off. When I showed her this, <laughs> it made her world because now she just goes and presses one button and her husband still got to go around and lock all the doors and shut all the windows. So, um, yeah, you can, can bring away the technology and simplicity to people's life. It's, it's good. So, and then we've got on to the kitchen one where we've got on cooking, dining and off. We've got the living room one, which is on entertain, TV mode and off. Although I'm describing these as specific things, this can be whatever you want it to be, as long as the symbols make sense to you. Uh, the, the, the other thing that people get hung up on is, what is a scene? So for me, I try and describe this as, think of a scene as an activity first. So what is the activity that's going to be in the space? So for example, in your kitchen dining, you're gonna have cooking, that is an activity. You're gonna have dining, that's an activity. In a living room, you're going to have like TV watching. That's an activity. Probably not a, a great activity, but it's an activity. 
you've got reading, which is another activity. So just keep thinking, forget about scenes just now, just think, what activities do I do in a room and how can I then make a lighting scene to help me do that activity? So for example, on the dining scene, you probably want to drop all the lights down low, but then have the table, the dining room table pendant up slightly brighter because you want to make that moody romantic type scene and have, I've, I've lost that ability because I've got three kids, but uh, anyway, you can sort of raise up the sort of dining uh, uh, pendant up a bit and that just creates that wee bit of romance. From the cooking side of things, you maybe want your countertops lit up a bit because you're chopping stuff up and your cooker lit up a bit brighter and everything else down a bit lower. So just think of activity and then the scene will follow from that side of things. Okay, so that is the scene keypads. And then the accessories. So we're on a face plates. So you've got, think of this as a grid system. So you pick your Pico and then you pick the face plates to suit. So you pick your grid and then you pick the face plates to suit that. So we've got single, we've got dual, and triple. Just one thing to note here is we've got loads of different finishes. We actually have more than what's shown on here, but this is the standard off the shelf ones that we've got. So we've got white and black polymer. We've got white clear glass. It's got a white film at the back of it. It's actually really stunning in a contemporary scenario. We've got satin nickel, satin brass, and uh, polished chrome. So from that, all of these finishes are available in single or dual. Now, the triple one that's shown at the top is only currently available in the polymers, so the white and black. So if you get on to doing that, just bear in mind that the three, three grid one is only available in the polymer finishes. Now, that may change moving forward, but that's, that's kind of what we've got as it stands today. So the other things that we've got, and this product's fantastic, and it's excuse me, excuse me Ross. Yeah. Does the does the the three the three gang fit a twin box the yes. same as the single gang fits the yeah. single box? That's yeah. that fits a standard the uh, UK back box. Aye, so the the single the single and the dual one fits a seventy five by seventy five back box. So whether it's metal, plastic, or whatever else, or it can screw straight to the wall as well, so it doesn't need a back box. Uh, you see in the top of the picture for the exploded image where you've kind of got a back plate and you can see the fixing holes. So the good thing that we've done is we've done it top and bottom and left and right, so that if you go in the box and say it's a, a specific box where it's got top and bottom lugs, uh, then you can fit it to it. If it's got side lugs, you can do it. Or if it's a metal box and it's top and bottom and left and right, then yeah, you can do do any option that's there. The wee Pico just slots into, there's actually just like two wee fingers that pop up. You slide it in there and then you pop the faceplate to, to complete the switch or the Pico. Uh, and that's it, and it's job done. The, the dual one rightly, Perfect. That is always going to be kind of side fix on that one. Um, but yeah, it fits straight to a, a double back box. All right. Yeah. Uh, the, the other fantastic one is these pedestal stands. I, I cannot begin to describe how useful these are in different environments. So think, think of a kitchen worktop where you just want to sort of control the light. So you want a simple wee remote that you want to kick about with you. People tend to use these primarily for the audio remote because they don't want that fixed to the wall. They kind of they want to be in the kitchen and control their audio. Then they want to maybe be at a dining table like myself where I'm working. And then I want to be able to play, pause, skip to the next track, etc. Or even just mute when I'm, a phone call comes in. You can do a simple mute, take your phone call, press play again, and you've got some, some music playing in the background again. The, the other place that these work fantastically well is bedsides. So forever, and I'm sure everybody's done this, and I did it myself in my own house, you fit switches to the either side of your bed if you want two-way switching, two-way and intermediate switching in a bedroom. And there's a few complications that come with that. I've got a bad back, and I know when I need to turn around and press that switch, it's a, it's a pain, a real pain. Uh, physically and mentally turning around to do it. Uh, you don't really know what you're pressing. You're stretching. Sometimes you're stretching past a table lamp and all the rest of it. I'm talking about real th third world problems here. I know that, but it's uh, it's not. It's just not a good way to do things. And the other thing that I had complications myself was, do you size that out for a queen size bed, a single bed, a king size bed, super king? It's, 
what size do you go for? And then what size is that headboard when it comes? Does it overlap? I just seen it at Loch Lomond Golf Club where they went for huge American beds. And now one one switch is on show and the other one's hidden behind the headboard. So only one person's got the ability to put lights on and off. So um, where this comes into effect is the wee pedestal stand. You sit that on the bedside table. You look in front of you. You got it right there. You can see what you're doing. You can press the lights on and off, uh, or you can shut the whole house down with the half moon uh, button that's there. It's it is such a cracking wee pro product, and it's genuinely not that expensive for it. It's it's really really good and worthwhile, worth a look. So on that one, we'll jump on to the next thing. So the the blinds. So. I want to hit this home and make sure that you understand we can do blinds. So from this, you can see all the different variants that we can do. The one that I missed out from here is the skylights, so the ones that are on an angle. So we can do them, that's not a problem. Uh, I just tried to sort of frame this so all the windows kind of look the same. So we've got roller blinds, we've got honeycomb blinds, which is kind of like a cellular blind. Great for insulation properties, etc. That You can tend to see them in conservatories more than anything. Uh, but we've seen people use them in bedrooms, etc. It's stunning. Uh, really good at keeping the light gap, the part between the sort of window frame and the glass down really tight. So room darkening for kids' bedrooms, it's, it's, it's really good. You've got Venetian blinds, so that's your slats. We have got up and down, and you can also tilt the vanes. Regardless of what position that bottom bar is in, you can tilt the vanes up and down, which is, is pretty good. And that's not what you get in most of the industry. So... That's that's a we added advent, advantage of using a Lutron one. Got Roman blinds, so you've got your fabric, and that kind of is actually a roller blind, but it's got taping at the back, and that creates your sort of folds in your fabric. Horizontal shear, which is trying to combine two different elements here. It's a roller blind, so when it comes down, you can still see your view out, and then we actually do a wee quarter turn once it's fully down. And that then gives you your privacy by sort of, it's a mixture between a Venetian and a roller. It's got veins that sit between two bits of fabric and that quarter ton shuts those veins. And then last but not least is the curtain track systems. So your real soft furnishing. We basically supply the curtain track, the aluminum profile with a motor on the end of it, or a drive unit on the end of it, because the drives are quiet, motor sounds loud, but drive is a nice quiet, quiet uh, drive unit up there and that can control your curtains open and close and there's nothing more fantastic than seeing that in operation uh, from a client's point of view so on that we've pretty much got and to make this super easy for you guys battery operated ones roller blind and honeycomb right you're realistically talking about four screws to mount these things Obviously, making sure it's level and a few other things, making sure the sizes are right, etc. But four screws, and then you've got a battery compartment that sits at the top. These two take uh, D cell batteries, so eight D cell batteries. Um, a few reasons we we went for um, alkaline batteries because usually at the top of a window you've got quite a lot of heat up there. So there is some people out in the marketplace that do rechargeable batteries. It's not a good place to to put a rechargeable battery. Uh, up, in, up in that space where it can get quite hot, hence why we went for the style of battery that we have. Now, the other blinds that we do, sort of the Venetians, the Romans, horizontal shears, curtains, these all need powered, right? They are they take more draw on a battery, so the, the wooden slats, for example, the heavier fabrics on the Romans, the curtain tracks that can be quite heavy, they need 24 volt power for that. So you will need a two core up at that window to achieve any of those styles. The, the other one I should maybe mention is the, the roller blind and the honeycomb that we've got there. If you've got concerns over the batteries, uh, so people may ask the question of how long will the batteries last for? So the, the answer to that is three years with three up and downs a day, typically. But we've got nice software so that when we put the, shade, or the, put the blinds into that software, it will tell you exactly how long you will get out of that the batteries on that. So, yeah, we can tell you exactly. Some I've, The lowest I've seen, I think, is 2.1 years, but that was a particularly big blind and heavy fabric, etc. But uh, we, can, we can 
give them the answer on that one. If they're really, really concerned about batteries, uh, maybe they're elderly or disabled or something like that, and they just do not have the ability to change batteries, we can, you can just wire a simple 12 volt transformer onto the two battery operated variants. Uh, and in that way, you'll never be changing batteries if that's what you want to do. On this, when I've been talking about battery, 12 volt, 24 volts, sorry, um, that's all to do with power. So the, all of these variants, Talker, RF, Clear Connect. So when you're sitting on an RA2 system, all your communication is done over the airwaves. You do not need to wire a communication cable up to these things. So just on a, a nice one scene, I give you, gave you a wee brief look at this. So this is fantastic. This is a wee nursery. This is uh, one of my colleague's nephews. But uh, just I'll play this video just so you can see it and you can see the blinds in action. So. So you've seen that happening, you've seen it moving. Now, the two distinct technologies that makes this brilliant, we've got a technology called intelligent hand bar alignment. So I'll just play it quickly again. Just watch as they come down. Every single blind is in line with each other. They're working in unison. So as that comes down, perfectly in, in unison, perfectly in line. The, the other thing is these drives are ultra, ultra quiet. So you're sitting around the sort of 40 decibel mark uh, is super, super quiet. And that's something I don't know if you guys have ever got involved or seen some of the, the stuff in the marketplace. You struggle to find a, a quieter drive unit than what's in these shades. So on that, the system, the capabilities of the system, where do we sit? So we talked about the, the main repeater. So we've got one main repeater that's always required if you're needing scene setting or any integration with any of the third parties such as Sonos, Alexa, etc. You've got the auxiliary repeaters if you need to add these and then you've got all your other components. So you need to count up the amount of lighting groups that you want to do. Sorry. And then you need to count up any shades that you want to do. They count as a device as well. And then you need to count up your picos. One thing to note is your faceplates for your Picos don't count as devices, so we're okay from that side of things. But your light, lighting grips, your shades, and your Pico controls, uh, that can only be 100 maximum. Okay, that is the system capabilities. One thing to note is if you're getting past, if you make a count of your lighting grips and you're at 50, you're probably on the limit where you want to be. If you're under that, totally fine, carry on. If you're over that, give me a phone call because you're probably, we just want to check that we're, we're not overcooking a system because we've run into that in the past where people try and take a system and oversell it for something that it's, it's just going to struggle to do. But yeah, just give me a phone if you're getting into, into that at all. The, the next one is, so on the retrofit side of things, we're talking about fitting things in ceiling voids, et cetera, dropping GU10 lights out and putting, putting the inline dimmer up there and then put the GU10 back, et cetera. Uh, we talked about pendants, for example. You can take a pendant down and maybe drill a, a round Euro fast fix box up. That gives you enough aperture to get the inline dimmer up, do your connections, and then fit the pendant back to the fast fix box. Don't do that with an 18 arms chandelier or not, obviously, because you're going to need a pad at the back of there. And yeah, you could end up with lath and plaster everywhere if you try and hang that off of a Euro fast fix box. But um, yeah, so there's plenty of options there. But I wanted to show you this. We, I got asked the question last time about some install pictures uh, where people were doing kind of new builds or they were trying to centrally mount some of the inline dimmers. So the one on the left is kindly done by Craig, and this is the, the job uh, out at Cleland that we talk about a few times. So that's shown an ABS box, obviously, and we've got the inline dimmers there, the circuit's coming back, and that was obviously pre before they were terminated. Uh, lid goes back on, nice install, uh, happy days, customers happy. The other one that another contractor did was, you've got the two ABS boxes again, for diversity, the guys kind of split it up so that if there's an issue on one side, then it's not going to affect the other. And that issue could be a light fin. I'm not talking about a Lutron issue there, obviously. It could be a short circuit with water if it's external. It could be a, a lamp that's shorted. Uh, it could be anything. But from there, 
the he basically just put down rail connections so he could land his incoming circuits or groups of fittings into these ABS boxes. Then he just used a three core to jump down and back up again from the inline dimmer or switch. The trunk and lids missing, it was just, I was happened to be there and I thought I want a picture of that because that could be useful. Uh, it could be useful for bars, restaurants and stuff like that as well. So that's a, a nice couple of wee install pictures to, to give you a, a wee flavour of what can be done. Okay, have we got any questions, Craig, or are we, are we all good from that side of things? Sorry, we're okay now, Ross. No, no, not a problem. I will carry on. So, whole part of this, remember, we're trying to make it simple. We're trying to take away the black magic, black art, and all the rest of it. So, we're trying to keep, keep this nice and simple. So, PCs are out of the equation. So I don't know if you've looked at all the lighting control systems, any smart home stuff where you may be looking at things like KNX and other nice protocols like that. You need a laptop to do this programming and you need to know what you're doing. We have tried to, and I don't want to call it dumbing it down, but we've tried to simplify this and use it to really help you guys sort of make this real just a progression from clicking buttons right, we've taken all the hard work out of it we've, tr we've spent hours and hours and hours of development to try and make this easy not only for yourself but for the end customer so that they can make their own changes themselves it, the, the last thing you want to do is sell a system and then say okay it's going to cost you my time to come back to to make some changes give the people the ability to do it themselves so that that's what we're all about I'd, I don't want to be charging people to go back and adjust a light on a scene or anything like that. It's just, it, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. So this system definitely helps them from that side of things. So on that note, we've got a wee setup video. So this this was done by Aicha, one of my colleagues. So I'm going to play it and she basically just guides you through from start to finish how to quickly set up a system. And you can see how quick and easy this is. So we'll start it playing and then uh, we'll come back as soon as this is finished. In order to set up a brand new RAW2 Select system, first check that you've downloaded the free app when connected to the internet or 4G. Next, on the device, go to settings and make sure that you're connected to the network that your hub is connected to, whether that's the home's permanent router or the wireless access point that you've brought with you, and launch the Lutron app. The initial landing page has the get started and the sign in items, which are for the homeowner to set up their account. We've created a quick start contractor mode, which doesn't require creating login credentials. So use that. Proceed to set up the system. Input your contact details in case they need any additions to the system in the future and select next on the top right. At this point, the app reminds you that you need to have installed your hardware to move forward. It then gives you a visual representation of how to connect the hub. Not that you'll need it, but it's there. Now it's looking for that main repeater on the network that you connected to, and for security, it requires you to identify it by physically pressing the button on the product to show that you're there. You can select to use the information you've already input to move forward. The client can name the home themselves, so again, click Next. We can see that it's already identified our geolocation with longitude and latitude. So when we click next, it sets that time and location on the system as it's the first time we're setting it up. It then takes us straight to the list of devices that we may have installed to start building the system area by area. Let's start with the inline dimmer and switches. These are probably in the ceiling behind a downlight or remotely mounted in a cupboard. So instead of having to get on a ladder and locate them to press physical buttons, we can find them remotely here. The system is now searching for any inline devices which haven't yet been assigned, whether this is 20 or two like we have here. And we can see that it's found both. So again, instead of having to take a note of the serial number before the installation to identify the lighting circuits connected to each device, we can now simply press flash on the app, which flashes the whole circuit of lights connected to that dimmer for easy identification. I now know exactly which one it is, and we can proceed to add it onto the system. 
This press brings up a list of room names and for the purposes of this we're going to create a nice kitchen. So I know that the lights that flashed are the under cabinet lights in this kitchen which allows me to input that on the app and when I press next those lights flash twice to let me know that they've been added. We repeat this process to add the next set of lights and so on. You can see that it doesn't have to search again as it's previously discovered it. I can now see the second set of lights flashing which I can add again to the kitchen. And I know that these are the island pendants which flashed. When I click next it adds the device and takes me to adding another device. I've now got a kitchen scene pico in my hand. So as per the instructions here, I can press the button button for 10 seconds until the LED on the device blinks quickly and the room list comes up again. I'm going to locate this in the kitchen and proceed. As you can see, it's a very easy process to just select each of the devices as you go and add them to the system. We're done adding devices, so all of this information that we've just input onto the app is transferred onto the main repeater and then stored on the Picos and inline devices. Now we have the main screen of the home set up showing the rooms and devices that have been added so far. The island pendant and under cabinets are shown to be currently on. I haven't done any programming on the keypad, yet if I press the off button on the physical kitchen pico I have in my hand, I can see that those lights turn off. When I press the on button, the lights turn on. And if I go into the keypad on the app, I can see that I have a replica of what's on my wall, which means that I can show you, when I go to edit device, that we already have preset scenes. For the dining button, the island pendants are showing at 50% and the under cabinets are 20%. It leaves the homeowner with something to start with that they can adjust in their own time. They can add lights from the dining room for example, close the Lutron blinds if they have them and even add music to that button with their favourite dining playlist. You can see here that without having to do anything, just because they have a Sonos speaker in the house, it already comes up here as a kitchen Sonos room. At the initial setup, that is all you need to do. So you can now send the homeowner invite from the ribbon at the bottom, put the homeowner's email details in, and click send invite. You can see a copy of the email that's about to be sent to them by Lutron, which you could also CC yourself in, and click send. That's your handover done. Easy peasy! Okay, so ho hopefully we can all see and understand that that's, that wasn't that complicated than what was done. The the one thing to note there is when it's asking you for specific lights, as in is it the kitchen island pendant, is it the cooker light, is it the dining room pendant, the reason that it's doing that is we're taking historical data based on the scene information that we've done across hundreds and thousands of jobs and we're basically using that to create the datum scenes that you're going to get initially in that system. So normally the scenes that you get are pretty good. And then that way you're just simply adding product into a room, handing it over and it looks like you're an absolute rock star at lighting controls. And yeah, clients love it. And then they can go on and make the amendments and changes as they see fit. If they want to tweak the pendants up and down, if they want the downlights to go up and down and, and adjust that scene, they can do it. So we've tried, tried to make this super simple. The, the next thing that we're trying to get away from... Really, sorry on that. Uh, everyone I've done, basically, I've not been logging laptops, as Ross, as Ross says. I've just actually used this Sam, a Samsung S7. It's done every job I've done. Yeah. You just take that in and you just work it with your phone. So you don't even... It's, it's, as I say, it's very simple. You're not taking laptops and things into the job with you. Yep. No, it's super, super, super simple. Uh, the the next thing that we want to get away from is some of these horrible, horrible images that are on. Uh, granted that some of these will look a bit more of the uh, commercial nature, but where you're having to try to label stuff up and you're putting red dots against things that are meant to be switched on or off, or you're trying to label up an American switch and 
oh, it's just horrible. I remember myself having a four gang dimmer. Um, my missus used to use one of them, and I, I never knew which one it, that was that she used because uh, I always used to use the under cabinet lights, which was the first one because that's how I wired it. She used to use two, three, or four, and I had no idea which one it was. So I would constantly just be pressing, pressing in and out, or dimming it up and down to try and figure out which one she had put on. It was it was a pain just to get the lights off. I was flicking lights on and off, left, left, right, and center. So yeah, we need to get away from this sort of horrible scenario. It's it did a job. Uh, it still does a job to a degree, but it's just not pretty. So moving on from that, we've this is why we look at the Pico remote simple and intuitive to use. So typically this is showing you kind of what we should be doing in different rooms. So if you've only got one room and the lights are on and off in that room, then use that one zone, non dim Pico. If it's dimmable, use the one zone, the three button raise and lower one, the favorite level there, that favorite level gives great advantage to people where they can just push and hold that middle button to set their favorite level. If you've got two zones in a room, I would always probably just opt for putting two of them side by side. Any more than two zones, then we should start looking at the scene keypads, which we'll come on to. 